But we're looking forward to a good service together tonight. Hi, we are the Gross family. David, Stephanie, Abby, Caleb, Daniel, and our two newest additions, Anna and Simeon. We are missionaries to the country of Moldova, a small former Soviet Union country located between Romania and Ukraine in Eastern Europe. We have been serving Christ in Moldova for over eight years, half of that time being in the northeastern part of the country. We have been serving in Soroka with Jacob and Viola Hughes and Sarah Bodily. We would like to share with you what has been accomplished by God's grace since our last furlough in 2013. One of our goals this last term was to complete the unfinished house we had purchased back in 2013. We all lived in one unfinished room upstairs for eight months while Jacob and Viola helped us finish the downstairs. When we moved downstairs, we lived in the dining room and living room while the upstairs was being finished. The work upstairs was made possible through the help of a mission team from our sending church, Heritage Baptist Church of Cordova, Tennessee, and a generous financial gift from my late grandfather. Finally, in April of 2016, we were able to use the upstairs bedrooms and enjoy the whole house. By God's grace, we now have a finished house. Due to the number of people in Soroka who do not understand Romanian, which is the national language, I spent another year and a half studying Russian. This was of great help for leading the Russian midweek service in Soroka during the Hughes' furlough. I still have a long way to go with Russian to be at the level I am with Romanian, but by God's grace, I am further along than I was our first term in Moldova. Our main goal this last term was to establish a church in the city of Soroka. We started with Sunday morning meetings at our house and Thursday midweek service at the Hughes' apartment for the first year and a half. During this time, a Filipino lady whose husband was in Moldova for work joined us. She had trusted Christ years ago but wanted to be baptized. We had the privilege of baptizing both her and Abby in the summer of 2015. Later that fall, Jacob and I found a storefront to rent for meetings in the center of Soroka. This new place gave us a stable location for Sundays, Thursdays, VBS in the summer, ESL lessons, and Bible studies. This past year, we had several people move out of town or out of the country. Our group in Soroka is smaller now, but by God's grace, we hope to see it grow. We have used several different avenues to get the Word of God to the ears and hearts of people. Jacob and I have gone door to door. Viola leads a ladies' Bible study the first Saturday of each month. The Hughes also lead an adult ESL with a Bible study after the lessons. Sarah Bodily teaches a children's ESL each week. Several of her students that she invited came to our VBS this past summer. One summer, right next to the Soroka Fortress, we hosted family evenings. We set up tables with gospel tracts and pamphlets with biblical teachings on the family. We had games and crafts that families could do together. The last two years, we have held conferences. The first one was on the family, and this year's was on the Bible. Each summer, we run a week of VBS at our house in the village of Zastinka and also a week in Soroka at our church's rental. The first year, VBS was a new concept to the people in town, but now the children and parents look forward to it. By God's grace, we have seen several trust Christ through our summer VBS. One of my favorite places to preach the gospel is actually our vehicle. Because most people do not have their own car, Many take public transport or hitchhike. This results in a captive audience. Through one of these witnessing opportunities, Jacob and I had the privilege of visiting a lady and leading her to Christ. When we moved into our house in the village right next to Soroka, we started getting to know our neighbors. One of them, a widow named Nadia, seemed interested in spiritual things. She was raised Orthodox, but believes that she is saved through Christ alone and not by works. I then started meeting in her home each week on Sunday afternoons for Bible study. 
We faithfully had the Bible study with her for two years before we moved it to our house so that we could invite other people. A mother with two children, who we met through our first VBS, received a Bible and began to come to our Bible study. Last year, another lady in our neighborhood that we met through our Soroka meetings started attending as well. For about a year, we ran a weekly Bible club in Soroka at a children's home. Unfortunately, the center was closed in the fall of 2017. At the same time, though, a private center opened in the village just north of Soroka, and several of the young people from Soroka were sent there. We met with the director there in the village and were welcomed to do the weekly Bible club there. We took several of the young people from the center to a Christian camp this past summer, and what a joy it was when one of them trusted Christ as his Savior. By God's grace, our team will continue ministering to these young people. Another goal for our team was to eventually plant churches throughout the region of Soroka. A widow from the village of Bolboch started coming periodically to our Sunday services in Soroka. She has arthritis in her knees and lives on the very edge of the village, but she would make the hour journey to our church. About half of that time was just walking to the bus stop. Jacob and I had began talking about starting a Bible study in her village sometime in the future. At the end of the summer last year, we found out about a Baptist young man, Alexei, and his mother who grew up in the village of Bolboch. They have been living in the capital city, but had been praying for many years for a Baptist church to be planted in their home village. Last year, he and his mother started taking steps to evangelize the village of Bolboch. Last year in September, he organized a medical missions team to come and asked if Jacob and I would preach the gospel to those who came to the clinic. We gave the gospel to around 400 people. Of those, almost 70 asked for us to visit them again and give them a Bible. The following two months, Jacob and I individually met with people and gave them the Bibles and offered home Bible studies. During this time, we found out about a small group of Baptists and a couple Pentecostals from Bolboch and neighboring villages that had been meeting in the village for the past eight years. A Pentecostal pastor from a village an hour away had been preaching there, but requested us to take it over. With this new church plant placed in our laps, we ended up having three services each Sunday, one in Soroka, one in Bolboch, and then the Bible study at our house in Zastinka. At our team retreat in August, we re-evaluated the busy Sunday schedule and decided to end the Bible study at our house and invite them to the Soroka meetings instead. By God's grace, we hope to see the works in Bolboch and Soroka grow. Upon our return to Moldova, we plan to lead the church plants in Soroka and Bolboch to become officially organized and self-sufficient. We plan to grow the groups we have through evangelism and discipleship. We are also praying for the Lord to provide Moldovans to lead the work in the future. Thank you for praying for us and faithfully giving. By God's grace, much was accomplished and much more will be accomplished in the future. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee when Jesus touched the blinded eyes and made them see. And though I did not see the empty tomb, that day I still believed, for I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb, and I believe that there is healing in the touch of His hand. But that greatest of all miracles was when my Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Now 
I have seen the lowest sin. Six oh, have life anew and be made pure, pure and whole. And I have felt him loose the chains of sin, and he set my spirit free. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb. And I believe that there is healing in the touch of his hand. But the greatest of all miracles when my Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Go and take your Bibles. We'll be in the book of Revelation this evening. Revelation chapter 4. I want to begin in verse number 10. Over in Moldova, it's very interesting. We have uh, just about any kind of group you can imagine. Uh, you know, a lot of times we think of, oh, oh, wonderful things have come from America to other parts of the world. Well, not everything's been wonderful. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, rock music, a lot of these other things have gotten over to other parts of the world as well and have had a negative influence. Um, one of the things that we deal with in Moldova are the Jehovah's Witnesses. And one of the things that uh, it's been a little side study of mine is uh, studying on the deity of Jesus Christ and being able to have an answer to give to them on Jesus Christ being our Jehovah God. And uh, one of the evidences here that I would say is, I want us to look here in Revelation chapter 4. It's the throne in heaven, and this is fast-forwarding in time. Verse number 10, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns. Sorry, before the throne, saying, "Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created." You know, this is our God. This is the throne, and this is what is in the future, uh, the scene of heaven there. But when you skip over to chapter 5, we're introduced to another person here. And uh, as you read the beginning part, it's the Lamb. And the same thing is said of him. Verse number 12, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. But I want us to look back at uh, verse number 9. These saints, these people that have, are around the throne and crying this out to Jesus Christ. And, they, and it says this, verse number 9, and they, sang, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. And notice what it says here. By the blood out of every, uh, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings, Made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I don't want to take a whole lot of time this evening, but I want us to look at why. Sorry, there are tissues up here. There's water, you guys are prepared for that, but I'm not having a problem with water. 
Sorry. Uh, when you look here, this is in the future. This is a date that is scheduled. Just as real as our date for going back to Moldova being January 15th. This is going to happen, folks. It's already scheduled. We're not going to change it. Government can't change it. I don't care who we, we run into. It's not going to change. Now, I love how it says here. It says that there's going to be people that will be there that are redeemed out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. This is why we don't just simply reach the people in our one location. But we have the goal of reaching the people throughout the world. This is why we are in Moldova. My coworker Jacob at our t annual team retreat this year, he preached him. Uh, he gave a devotional here in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and his point was this, that he is worthy. In fact, I've been signing the end of my emails and correspondence with people with that. He is worthy. And it's been at the forefront of my thoughts and my motivations. Why do we want to go back to Moldova? Because he is worthy. And all your other people that you have sent out and are working, what is, why did you do what you did this morning? with feeding all those people, with inviting them to come for them to hear the gospel, it's because he is worthy. You know, when it all boils down to it, this is our greatest motivation, that he is worthy. Now, notice the scope of this, of his goal. His goal is for people from all kindreds of all countries to worship him. The Bible says he doesn't find the pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. When we read in Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We see God's heart's desire here. We see what he, he wants. And when you look in, uh, in also in 2 Timothy, he also ends up saying that, uh, that his desire is for, um, for all to be saved. This is his heart's desire. This is God's, God's passion on this. Um, 1 Timothy 2.4 is actually the verse. Let me, let me read that. 1 Timothy 2.4. Uh, verse number three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is what God's heart's desire is, is for all to come to the knowledge of the truth, for them to know Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, we know this is not what's going to happen. You know, there's this teaching and such that there's is a thing called universalism. And if you hear it, run from it. Realize it's false teaching. There's some that say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Love wins was the title of a book that was written by a false teacher. Love wins. And universalism says that in the end, all people are going to end up being with God in heaven. They're not going to end up being punished in eternity in hell. Jehovah's Witnesses says there's no eternal punishment in hell. A lot of people, they don't want to think that that is, exists. But, my friends, it does. And it's a real location. It is a real suffering. It is a real punishment that is going to be received by those that have not repented and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in, in the Gospels, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 7, he says, wide is the gate and, and that leads to destruction. And how many find it? There will be many. But narrow is the gate. And how many people find that? Few. Now, when Jesus says this, he's not saying, this is what I want. You know, I'm trying to hide this thing, and I don't want people to get there. But he's stating this is the reality. Folks, this is just, this is what's happening. The problem's not with God, though. The problem is with people. It's with the heart of man. And I dare say also, another thing that affects that is the willingness of the believers to preach the word of God and to be testimony and witness for him. John, when he writes here in the scene of heaven, he says that there are people out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. But it says that they were redeemed to God by the blood. You know, it's interesting, when we go to Moldova and we share the gospel with people, there's not a different message that we take over there. You know, some things you have to adapt to different locations. Uh, if you go over to Moldova, uh, we had a lady come over and visit us with her son, and uh, we heard a scream downstairs, and we went downstairs, and she's la after she was done screaming, then she started laughing hysterically. And when we uh, found out what was going on, she's holding her curling iron that she brought from the States, and there's her hair stuck to the curling iron. It had melted it off. And when I looked at it, I said, oh, well, this is only for 120, but the electricity in our country is 220 volts. So, you know, not everything goes between countries. We understand that. There's differences in culture, and certain things fly in one culture, and they sure don't in another. 
But when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, this remains the same. We don't change it. God has established it. And the same message that is preached here in America for people to be saved is the same message in Moldova. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I was witnessing to a man uh, up in Maryland. And uh, he said, so you're telling me there's just one way? You believe that that is it? How arrogant. He says, you're full of beep. I said, sir, I love you. To me, it doesn't matter what someone believes. I'm going to love them. But I'm going to stick to what the Bible says, that there is only one way. And if there is only one way, then that means people need to know about this one way. One thing about all these people that will be there, they will be there not by chance, but because they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them that will end up declaring, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. If they have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's because they heard the gospel. But for those people from every kindred and every tongue to hear the gospel, we have to go. And this is why you guys send out missionaries. This is why missionaries that come through, just like us on deputation, this was our very first missions conference was at this church back in 2007. And I'll tell you, it was a good start. Very good start. But you send out missionaries because God has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, it's obvious we can't be in every place all at the same time. So we commission or deputize other people to go in our stead. And this is why missionaries have that time of deputation. So what are we doing in Moldova? We're trying to add people to the scene that you read in Revelation chapter 5. What are the other missionaries doing? Their goal is to add people to that scene in Revelation chapter 5. Why did you have a turkey dinner this morning? So you can add people to that scene in Revelation chapter 5. It's all through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this is another thing that I love here. There is no restriction here by nation, by social status, by bank account, by color of skin, by language. There's no limits to this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is able to reach any type of person, which is why I can go to any person in Moldova, America, Romania, Ukraine, you name it. We can go there and we can say, Jesus loves you. He's died on the cross to make a way of escape for the punishment that is going to come to you if you do not repent and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He's died. He's willing to change your life and to make you his child. We can say this to any person. We don't have to say, are you one of the elect or not? Hold on. Let me ask God. Okay? The gospel is available to anyone. The other wonderful thing that we see here is that it says in verse number 10, and he, has, and he asked, made us unto our God kings and priests. I want us to stop and think about this for a minute. Regardless of the status that somebody is in, with how much money they have or, or whatever, they one day will be kings. Kings. Jesus Christ has given us his riches. When you read in Ephesians there, he's made unto us available his riches, the riches that are in Christ Jesus. Which is a wonderful thing when I talk to the people of Moldova. It's the poorest European country. It breaks my heart to see how many people are in need in that country with material things. It's not that they're suffering to pay their cable bill. It's not that, oh, no, you know what? I went over on my charge card and I can't buy that extra Starbucks today. We're talking about people that need wood for winter in order to actually have heat during the cold. We're talking about people that don't have the money to get the medical needs taken care of. And it's a life or death situation. But you know, even those people there, through Jesus Christ, can be made rich. Of what they have to look forward to of, for, in all eternity. They may be paupers on this earth, but through Jesus Christ, what will await them in eternity is matchless. I wish I could go and I could change things for them. They, it, it's, it's odd, as an American, we're all about capitalism, and yet we hear the Moldovans talk about the Soviet era as the good old days. But everyone had a job. They had their needs met. Maybe they didn't have as many freedoms, but they were taken care of. And now they look at their freedom, and they see how much they're suffering. They don't have their basic needs being met. 
Now, from my perspective, it's because of the corruption. The corruption has held back any kind of blessing in that country. And the corruption goes all the way from the government all the way down to the doctors, the police, the teachers that want bribes. Uh, that's the way it is. There's a funny commercial there in Moldova someone was telling me about. There was a medical instructor who had um, had his students and he was taking bribes and, and such from this one student. This one student just did, didn't study at all, didn't do his, his job well, but in the end, he ended up bribing the teacher and the teacher gave him a good grade, he passes. Years go on, that same teacher is on the operating table and as they're putting the gas on him to put him out, he looks up to see who his doctor would be operating on him and it was that student who didn't study and do well in school that he had gotten through. And he goes, no! But unfortunately, the, the corruption does affect things. I feel like we are going in the right direction as a country over there, and I'm thankful to see that. But, you know, I know that's not going to be the answer to things. Okay, yeah, it's a temporary fix. Our life, the Bible says, is but a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanisheth away. But the Bible says here that these people will declare, Lord, you have made us kings. And then the next thing it says here, it says that you have made us priests. Over in Moldova, the main religion over there is Eastern Orthodoxy. How many of you have ever heard of Catholicism? Okay. Eastern Orthodox, is a, it's a sister, okay? They're very similar. They started out, and then there was a branch a little over 1,000 years ago. And, they, and they, about 1,000 years ago, they, they split off. Of course, the Orthodox say, we, we're, we kept to the right stuff. In fact, the word Orthodox means correct doctrine or correct teaching. But the priests there, they actually very much, you'll see a lot of symbolism, uh, similarities between the, the priests in Moldova and the priests of the Old Testament. That tells you what era they're still living in. And these people feel that they cannot reach God. These people in Moldova see God, direct, rightly so, that God is a holy God and He is high and mighty. And they feel very unworthy but they feel that they have to do all these things and follow the priest and, uh, and listen to this certain holiday and uh, light this candle and follow this tradition and fast during this time in order to somehow, somehow appease this God. And it's sad to see all the things that they will go through, all the things that they know, but yet they don't know the Word of God. But through Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, our great high priest, he has made us priests. We don't have to go through some man on this earth to know our God. Jesus Christ, he tore that, the, the curtain in that temple from top to bottom. We now have direct access to this holy God. Not because of who we are. We are sinners. But it's through Jesus Christ. It is through, as they said, through his blood that has cleansed us and has washed us from our sins. And the people of Moldova need to hear this. The people of all these other countries, they need to hear this. That Jesus Christ has died to make us priests, to make us to be able to come to our Savior. Our neighbor who used to live across the street from us, when we first arrived in Moldova, once she heard we weren't Orthodox, she wouldn't have anything to do with us, talking about any kind of religion and stuff, but as we would talk to her and stuff, there was, at least we were on a, a decent relationship with her. She's uh, about 80 years old and taking care of a 90-something-year-old lady. And, uh, but she liked her kids, and so she'd come over and visit them. She'd bring us over raspberries. She had this big raspberry patch in her yard. She'd come over and bring us those things and invite the kids to come over and pick cherries from her tree or apples. And uh, try talking to her about the, about the Lord, but because we were in Orthodox, she didn't want to hear it. We gave her a Bible. She gave it back to us. She had this mangy dog. I mean, um, imagine the, like the Taco Bell dog, but on methane or some, or on meth. Uh, it's kind of that, if you can kind of imagine this, this thing. Uh, she fed it the old bread and usually had, like, missing hair on its back. It, it, was, it was a sad-looking dog. But this dog was her best friend. This dog followed her everywhere, protected her. Um, this, this was her dog. One day I was over there because we, we would help her out with things and I'd shovel the snow in the winter time so she can get to the well to get her water. We're talking the kind you lower the bucket and crank it up. Um, 
And one day when I was over there, I took a picture. Her dog was sitting there instead of biting my ankles trying to for a change. And I took a picture of um, Sarich. And uh, shortly thereafter, though, the dog died. And so she, it was hard on her. And then I thought, I had the idea, why don't we print out the picture of her dog and give it to her for Christmas? So we printed it out, uh, went to a place, got it printed, and put it in a frame and, and took it to her. And uh, you want to talk about something that just made her day. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting, the Moldovans, the Orthodox, they have icons of all these priests and Mary and Jesus and such. They have, she has them all in her house. Now she has her icon of her dog. Uh, I don't think she praised him, though. But that Christmas, I was able to sit down in her house and go through the gospel with her, and she listened to it. And you know how hard it was to hear her? She's up there in years and says, you know, I, I, I still believe you. We have, to, we have to do these good works. And she said, I'm old. I can't do the good works I used to do. I don't know if I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to make it. I don't think I'm going to make it into heaven. And telling her, listen, it's not going to be by what you do. It's through what Christ has done. This is what the people are thinking. They are going through this life, poor as all can get out, and not realizing that they can become kings and priests through Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to be able to know our God, to know that we are not poor, regardless of what we have on this earth. We are rich in Christ. That's why we should be some of the most joyous people on the earth. And we're priests. As a little side note, do you take advantage of that? Do you go directly to God? Do you spend time with him? Do you talk to him in prayer? You have the right to as his child. Because you, we believe in what's called the priesthood of the believer. And, the, and they, so this, this group, and, and they're singing, it says in verse number 12 of Revelation chapter 5, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now this number is going to be without number. There's going to be a lot of people there throughout the span of history. Yes, there's going to be a lot of people there. But where are you going to fit in in this? First of all, are you going to be in this group? If there's never been a time when you have acknowledged the fact that you are a sinner worthy of God's judgment, if there's never been a time in your life when you have repented of your sin, recognized, I am a sinner, I am worthy of God's judgment, I don't want to stay the way I am, but I can't change myself. And by faith, turn and accept Jesus Christ, ask him to be your Lord and your Savior, and to forgive you of your sins and change your life. The Bible says that, he will make us a new creature. We are new creatures in Christ. The old things are passed away. We're not perfect, but he has begun a good work in us once we accept him as our, as our Savior and Lord. So let me encourage you. If there has not been a time, let's make that decision today. If we look at the other scene where all the other people are, it would frighten you. They're in hell. They're in burning and fire with no hope, no way of escape. But that doesn't have to be that way for you. Humble yourself and turn to Christ and accept him. So that was my first question. Are you going to be there, first of all? Second thing, what are you doing to add more people there? What are you doing to add more people there? Those of you that were involved in the thing this morning, the outreach with the turkey dinner, praise the Lord. Keep it up. But don't stop there. Be involved. Have gospel tracts with you. Hand these out to people. Talk to people. Do you know the majority of the people that I give a gospel tract to and talk about the Lord, say thank you at the end? Are there people that will bite your head off? Yeah. That's okay. Another message I've been preaching on furlough uh, is going through the lessons that I've learned this last term in Moldova. And one of them says this. I'm not responsible for how people respond to biblical truth. You've got to leave that in God's hands. I am responsible to speak the truth in love. So if you're not involved in that, I encourage you to get involved in it. Young people, how many of you are not homeschooled, you children here, and you go to a public school? Raise your hand. Is there any public school kids? All right. Me too, okay? I was a public school kid. It's hard, isn't it? But you can be a witness there to those people. Those of you that are adults, 
Share, give the gospel to people. If you don't know how, talk to your pastor. He will more than, uh, he'll be more than happy to talk to you about that. I believe there's a church visitation too. Be involved in that as well. Why? What is our motivation? He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Do you need to make the decision to accept Jesus Christ tonight? Or if you already have, are you doing everything you should to add more people to that count? Let's pray, and then I'll hand this over to Pastor. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Bible Baptist Church. I thank you for Pastor Slayball and his leadership here. I thank you for the people. Lord, what a blessing it is to see all the new hands as well. Father, continue to work in these hearts and these lives. Lord, these are your children. These, this is your church. You desire to do wonders through them. Lord, you have ordained for them to be your messengers. You've ordained for them to give the gospel, to preach the gospel. And Father, I pray that you'd give them boldness, help them to grow in their walk with you, help them to, to be a good testimony for you wherever they go. And Father, I pray that Bible Baptists will continue to do their part in adding to that number that will be there in Revelation chapter 5. Lord, thank you so much for the part that they have had in supporting us and praying for us. Lord, I pray for my family, myself, my team in Moldova, Jacob and Viola and Sarah, and the other people in our church plants in Moldova. Father, would you please help us to add to that number. Help us to be a strong gospel witness for you. In Jesus' name we pray.